Thank you, Alyssa, for your testimony, for your faithfulness. Um, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. I love the absence of asterisks, the omission of any exceptions. Let all the peoples praise you. How might we be communities of all the peoples, where members with and without disabilities can live and learn and worship and work and serve and support one another as one body? Now, I think probably a social scientist from Vanderbilt coming to speak on this type, it might seem a bit surprising. To be honest, the 18-year-old version of me would be surprised as well. You see, I grew up in the absence of people with developmental disabilities, or at least so it seemed. As I think back on my own childhood, I don't remember young people with Down syndrome or intellectual disability or autism being in the classes that I took, or the teams I joined, the clubs I was part of, or the jobs that I held. And maybe the same was true for many of you. And so a career focused on uh, accelerating inclusive ministry would have probably been the furthest thing from my teenage mind. But that all changed the summer after my freshman year when I was at a different university, and God stumbled me into some new relationships with young men and women my age with intellectual disability, relationships I probably would not have pursued on my own. You see, at the time, faith and disability were probably the furthest things from my life and the furthest things from my mind. But I quickly became captivated by the friendships that I formed with Wayne and with Margaret and John Ray. And as someone who had come to think that my worth was really measured most in my accomplishments and in my abilities, each of those friendships reminded me that neither is what makes me lovable or made me valuable. And I remember thinking, how could someone befriend me and love me and not know all the incredible things I could do or think or say or had accomplished? But of course, that's not how love works, is it? I was uh, experienced for the first time belonging, and it upended so much of what my young mind thought was important. But more than that, I was compelled by the testimonies that each shared about their deep love for Jesus. Though John Ray could not speak and Wayne struggled with words, their faith was deep and certain. They worshiped with a glad abandon. They trusted with, without seeming reservation. They knew for certain that they belonged to God. And how much I longed to have that same kind of assurance. It was an enviable faith. And so I followed their lead and I finally gave my life to Christ. May all the peoples praise you. Now that shouldn't be a surprising story at all. It's an ordinary story of how God's grace flows through his people to transform lives. All of God's people, no asterisks, no exceptions. But it's a rare story still because our lives so rarely interact in our schools, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, and even in our churches. How might we become communities where the friendship and the faith and the gifts of people with and without disabilities are readily exchanged and received? Well, I'd like to share an answer to that question that emerges through the research that I've been involved with for several decades at Vanderbilt and elsewhere, where our work has strived to understand what it means to be a community marked by believing and belonging where both abound together. And to set the stage, I want to share a little bit of history that you might not be familiar with. Uh, my kids often say that I'm old, and when I protest vigorously, they remind me that I was born in the 1900s, and then I, I <laughs> relent. They're right. But I was born in the early 1970s. And that was a time when individuals with developmental disabilities were wholly excluded from so many aspects of community life. They were denied access to local schools, to workplaces, to neighborhoods, and so many other activities. There were holes in our communities. Our communities were incomplete. And things began to change in the 70s and 80s as new spaces and programs were created for children and adults with disabilities to learn and work and live and recreate. But those opportunities usually were provided in separate settings, apart from anyone else who didn't have a similar label. And in most communities, everyday life was lived away from people with developmental disabilities. Then, in the 90s, the time I ended up coming to Wheaton later, and in the 2000s, the shift was towards ensuring that those with disabilities were integrated into ordinary aspects of community life. Schools and businesses and churches and, and community programs expanded considerably, but the opportunities that emerged still involved a certain separation. Different classes, specialized ministries over there that place people with developmental disabilities near but not really among anyone else without a disability. And there's a huge difference between being near and being among. 
Which takes us, of course, to the present day, where our focus is fixed on the full inclusion of people with disabilities in the same classrooms and clubs and colleges, and church activities and community programs as anyone else. Inclusion from being a part to being among to now being with one another. Do you see the very different portraits of community reflected in these images? I share them for a couple reasons. The first is it turns out this actually isn't past history at all. These are our prevailing ministry and educational models. You'll find examples of these varied portraits in the 300,000 churches and 14,000 Christian schools and scores of community Christian colleges all across the United States. And second, I share it because I'm convinced that we have further to go. Because people want to be more than merely included or integrated, they want to experience belonging. We long to belong. And maybe this means we start to come to see one another in fundamentally different ways, not as the ins and the outs, the strangers and the members, the labeled and the ones who do the labeling, but we're one community, diverse absolutely, but every person of equal and immeasurable worth. I think it also means that we don't just share space, we also share our lives. We become knitted together, woven into relationships, and we remain involved in each other's lives after class ends, beyond the benediction, after we clock out of work. Do you see the very different picture, uh, portrait between inclusion and belonging? It's the difference between being present and having a presence. It's the difference between welcoming someone when they, when they arrive and actually aching because of their absence. Are our schools and colleges and churches truly communities of belonging, and how will we know we've arrived? Well, there are lots of ways to answer that question, but I'd like to foreground this morning what we've learned from the lived experiences of those with developmental disabilities and their families who've been part of our various studies over the years. How do you know you belong? They shared that belonging is experienced when you're present and invited, when you're welcomed and known, when you're supported and cared for, when you're befriended, needed, and loved. And I want to highlight each of these because there's so much work for us to do in each of these areas. And I'll be begin with presence because it's so hard to feel like you're part of a community from the outside, isn't it? And so many of the other facets of belonging uh, become hard or impossible to experience from a distance, to be accepted, to be supported, to be needed, and to be loved. One in five Americans has a disability. One in seven children has a disability. If we all left this building together and walked through the neighborhoods that surround this campus and knocked on doors, one in every three households would include at least one member with a disability. It's true in the communities that you live in as well. Right. What might a glimpse, though, into our schools and churches reveal about which of our neighbors might still be missing? And if absence is more common than presence, what stands in the way? Is it barriers of attitude or architecture or awareness or expectations, barriers of theology or priority? Baseline, uh, presence is the baseline for belonging. It's our starting point, but it's not our destination. And of course, the antidote to absence is invitation, to be sought out, to be pursued. Rather than waiting or hoping for those with disabilities and their families to arrive, the posture of a church or a, a school committed to belonging starts to pursue people who aren't yet there. And we are called to invite, aren't we? The great banquet isn't set for a, a select few. Let all the peoples praise you. And God's design for the body is so much grander than our own. We're to invite those who never get invited out, to invite where no one else is inviting with an irresistible offer that fills the very house of God. And such invitations still remain too rare, like they were for Wayne and Margaret and John Ray. And there's a testimony here because it speaks volumes when churches and Christian schools are on the forefront of inviting, and it speaks volumes when we're not. Well, third, belonging involves being welcomed. It's to be received with an authentic delight. It's when people find pleasure in your presence. And we're very quick sometimes to proclaim our communities to be welcoming, but it's not the host who determines what's welcoming, it's the guest. And we have to be rich with hospitality, greeting people when they arrive, remembering their names, asking about their week, introducing them to others, inviting them to be part of a small group, and noticing when they're not there and just following up to find out why. These are ordinary gestures that matter so much because you'll hear very few lukewarm stories about church from families. 
In one of our studies, we found that one in three families had left their congregation because their son or daughter with disabilities wasn't welcomed or included. One in three, how do we widen our welcome? Well, fourth, belonging involves being known. It's like the old sitcom Cheers, which I now realize probably none of you ever watched. <laughs> the sitcom says, the, the theme song says, we all wanna go where everybody knows our name. It's about being known, but it's actually more about how people are known because views about disability so often place the accent on what people struggle to do or uh, cannot do. Oh, but John Ray can't walk, or Wayne struggles to talk and Margaret finds it hard to read. That's what the world so often sees. It's so often all that the world sees. But what an incomplete way to come to know someone within the body. Such a view flattens the portrait of a person. It's the danger of a single story. And there is, of course, a different way to know people by the strengths and the gifts and the passions and perspectives that they bring to their relationships and to the communities, by the things that remind us someone is absolutely indispensable. Because when we're committed to belonging, we start to learn each person's unique story. We strive to see everyone as God sees them, as beautiful, as a new creation, as very good, as called by name, as fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, fifth, acceptance always accompanies belonging. The parents in our studies talk about their children with disabilities being welcomed without condition, loved wholeheartedly, embraced for all of who they are, treated like family. Those are the things we want to hear from families over and over and over, but they're not the things that families often hear themselves over and over and over. We're just not really equipped to serve your child. We don't really do inclusion here. Maybe you'd be more comfortable down the street at a church that has a ministry for that, right? Some of the same prejudices and stereotypes that are out in the world sometimes permeate our faith communities, but our attitude should be strikingly different than the world around us. And no one in our midst should ever wonder whether there's a place for them. Well, six, the need for support is an absolutely universal experience. We were never meant to go it alone. And support should be abundant within the body. A ride to events, help from a peer, accessible materials, the right technology, flexible expectations. The right supports actually make presence possible. And it's a very tangible way that we say, we want you here. So we ask good questions. What could we do to make Sunday morning the best day of the week for your child with autism? How can we come alongside your family all seven days of the week? Uh, what can we do to welcome you well in this community? Communities that are committed to belonging see that kind of support as a forethought, not an afterthought. It's always essential, never optional. And seventh, healthy communities are marked by care for one another. We're called to look to the interests of our brothers and sisters to bear each other's burdens. And receiving that kind of care assures you that you matter and that you belong. And the challenge here, or the opportunity for us, is to think about all seven days of the week, not just for a few hours on Sunday morning. It means stopping by to check in on someone, attending a doctor's appointment with them, helping them find a job, praying together, helping them pay a bill, calling to say hello, just being present together, and receiving those same things back. And the great thing about it is none of those things require expertise or experience related to disability. They're ordinary gestures that we're called to do. Well, eighth, belonging is rooted in relationships. It's about having people in your lives who know you and like you and accept you and need you and miss you when you're not there. That desire for friendship is a universal need. It's not a special need at all. And it's grounded in the core belief that we were created for community, that it's not good to be alone. And we can be welcoming, we can be accepting, we can extend support or care, but friendships take belonging deeper. It's about having someone in your life who says, I choose you too. And we should shine when it comes to friendships as churches and schools. And this of course has implications for how we think about ministry and schooling related to those with developmental disabilities. If our main models of uh, ministry are separate, then the opportunity for those with disabilities to uh, develop friendships and be chosen as friends becomes more limited but also the opportunity for others to encounter the faith and the friendship and the gifts of those with disabilities also becomes limited. 
Well, ninth, real community is marked by a real reciprocity among members. Every person is seen as having gifts and talents and strengths and stories that can benefit others in the entire community. Every person is endowed with inestimable worth, but not every person feels valued. And so much of society still struggles to see the ways that those with developmental disabilities can enrich and enliven communities. So when a church or school comes to see people with disabilities as indispensable to their flourishing, that is a powerful counterpoint to the watching world. We all want to know that our presence matters, right? that we're needed, that our absence evokes a longing for our return. And I flash back often to the 18-year-old version of myself, and I'm so incredibly grateful that Wayne and Margaret and John Ray welcomed me and accepted me and befriended me that they shared their faith so unreservedly with others, that they embraced and loved someone like me. That was ministry by people with disabilities. Three people who might be overlooked by society as a promising avenue through which Jesus might call others to him. And yet the opposite is absolutely true. Their faith and their gifts were just as real, just as attractive, just as much a conduit for God's life-changing grace. Where would I be now if I had not encountered all they so generously shared? And last, there's love. And you don't need a Vanderbilt professor to tell you what love has to do with belonging. Right? We go to great lengths for those we love. We make allowances. We go the extra mile. We avoid what's expedient. We work for people's good. And love is what leads us to care about people's flourishing all seven days of the week, after class dismisses, once the final hymn is sung, after we've clocked out of work. And when people talk about the communities that matter most to them, they usually talk about the love that they encounter there, where love abounds, belonging is all the more likely to be experienced. Well, this is the portrait of belonging that emerged from people with disabilities and their families who shared their stories and their struggles as part of our projects. And it should push us towards reflection and also towards response. As we think about the places where we worship and work or live or learn, are people with disabilities personally and purposefully invited? Are they present in all aspects of what we do? Do they experience an extravagant welcome? Are they well known and known well throughout the community? Are they accepted without condition or caveat, given the support they need to be part of all that we offer? Are they receiving care in ways that contribute to their flourishing? Are they developing deep and enduring friendships with others? Are they seen as needed and indispensable to the thriving of the community? And are they loved deeply and unconditionally? I hope all of this resonates with you because it's actually what we want for every member of our school, every member of our church. This is never actually a conversation only about those with developmental disabilities. It's a window into what we all want. Belonging's not a special need either. It's a universal need. And we do all of these things on the screen in response to God's incredible generosity to us because we belong to God. We love because we have been loved. We befriend because we have been befriended. We care for others because we are cared for and on and on. So let me close by returning to that series of images I shared at the outset. Which of these five portraits describes the communities that you work in, that you learn in, that you worship in or live in? And how might you be catalysts for change to spur communities to new practices and postures that widen the welcome on this campus and throughout the communities that you serve and live in and work in, so that all really do belong. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Amen.